So we now have a nice computer program that will simulate objects falling under gravity with no drag. But there's nothing here that we couldn't do perfectly well just with normal equations. But now let's add drag, wind resistance, and now we're getting into the realm of things that are much harder to do with analytic mathematics with a closed form solution. So for an object moving at um, reasonable speed through the air, the fluid flow is going to be turbulent, and in that case the drag force is given by the drag force equation, half c a rho v squared. Now that tells you the magnitude of the force. It doesn't tell you what direction it's going in. So that's not actually going to be very useful in the current situation. Because when our ball flies off sideways, the drag force is going to be in this direction. But then when the ball is going down here, the drag force is going to be in this direction. It's always going to be opposing the motion through the air. Now note here we're assuming there's no wind, that the air is just stationary. OK, so what we need to do is turn this nice equation into a vector equation, which actually gives us not merely the magnitude of the drag, but also makes it point in the correct way. So what's the correct way? Well, we have the velocity v, and it's pointing in the opposite direction. So it's pointing in the direction of minus v, where v is a vector. Now the normal way that you get vectors to point in different directions is to use a unit vector. So that's v with a little upside down v on top of it. And that's a vector pointing in the direction v of length 1. In this case you want minus the normalized v hat, because that'll be a vector of length 1 that points in this direction. So we can rewrite our equation. We have to replace the v with mod v squared, because it's the magnitude of velocity, and then have it point in direction v hat in a minor sense. So by replacing v here with mod v, that's the magnitude of the velocity, so that makes it vector safe. And we've now added the unit vector in this direction to make it point backwards along the motion. So that's the vector form of the drag equation in the case where there's no wind. OK, so let's actually add that to our computer code. So we've set up gravity, let's set up drag. So we'll define the drag coefficient, that's probably about 0 0.7 or something for a sphere, depending on how rough the surface of the sphere is. Cross-sectional area, that's going to be uh, pi r squared. So that's pi times sphere dot radius star star 2, which means squared. Density of air, I call it rho. Um, density of air in camera is about 1.1. OK, so that's the constants defined. Now, in the loop, we can't just calculate the drag out here. If we calculated the drag out here, then it's never going to change as we move. But as we fly, we're going to be changing us, people are going to be changing our direction, and the drag force is going to change. So we could define g up here because it's not changing as we go around. But we're going to have to define the drag force inside the loop because it's changing! OK, so let's, somewhere in here, work out the drag force. We'll call it drag force, for example. And that's going to be minus a half times c times a times rho times... Now, we need to use the magnitude of the vector. Now, luckily, Visual Python has magnitudes of vectors built in. If you go to the help. Working with 3D objects, you'll see down here vector operations. And because the software was written by physicists, they've got lots of vector operations. And particularly we've got the mag of a vector, which is the, how long a vector is. And we've got the norm of the vector, which is a unit vector in that direction. 
So it's half C A rho V squared, and that should be mag. Now V, it's the velocity, which means it's ball dot vel squared. And now we need to do it times the norm ball dot vel. So this is calculating how strong the force is, and that's getting it to point in the correct direction, and the minus sign means it points in the opposite direction to the velocity, not in the same direction as the velocity. If you got that wrong, you're going to have drag speeding things up, which would be kind of exciting. We might try that in a second. OK. Um, now, Python should do raising to powers in the bottom mass order before um, multiplication, so this should work. It's the mag squared times the norm. It's not going to mag to the power of two times the norm, but just to be on the safe side, I might put a bracket in around there and there just to make sure it knows which order it's doing everything. You can't be too careful about these things. Um, let's see how this works then. The moment of truth. Will it run? Oop, something's wrong. Um, Sphere dot radius star star two cannot read properties of undefined reading star star. Okay, let's try and figure out what's going wrong there. A equals pi times uh, I call it sphere dot radius. It's actually ball dot radius. A ball is a sphere, but it's not called sphere. So that's the mistake there. Wasn't a very helpful error message. Uh, let's try this. Okay, and well, at least it's running. Um, it didn't look very different. So, how do we test if it's actually working? Um, well, this is a one kilogram ball. It's probably the drag's not going to be a big effect. But let's make the ball a bit lighter. Oh, we've forgotten something. <sighs> I've got lots of things actually. There are lots of reasons why it doesn't work. We've worked out the drag force, but we haven't done anything with it. What we need to work out is how the drag force changes the velocity. So we've taken the the new velocity equals the old velocity plus g times the time step. And now we've got to add the effect of the drag. So it's going to be plus drag force over m times dt. So the f acceleration due to drag is going to be using f equals ma, the drag force divided by the mass. That'll be the change of velocity in one second, and if we've only got 0.01 seconds we need to multiply by dt. Okay, so hopefully that'll mean that drag will actually do something now. Let's see if this runs and if it makes a difference. Well, it's making a difference. It landed much closer to the bottom of the tower than it did before. Let's make sure it's behaving sensibly. If we make the mass more, like, say, 10, now drag should have very little effect. And it goes further out, which is good. Now if you make it really lightweight, like 0 0.1 kilogram, now the drag is going to be really important. Let's see what happens. It doesn't really even get off the top of the tower, so it's just falling at a steady, smooth speed, the terminal velocity. So that's what we'd expect for drag. Um, it's always good to test it by making sure it does the right sort of things and the right sort of behaviour. Uh, let's put the mass up to something like 0.5, uh, make the launching velocity higher, say 5. What we can check is, so let's just check how that works. Yep, so it flies out the projectile motion, but then it stops and falls vertically. So that's what I'd expect. Let's say we made the density of the air much less, say 0.1. What happened now? Well, what I'd expect to happen is it's not going to stop so rapidly. And indeed, it's behaving more like normal projectile motion. If you make the density really large, like 100, like 1,000, so it's in water, now we haven't got buoyancy in here, this is just drag. What's going to happen now? Ooh, not very much, it's not working. It's probably having such a big force it runs off like crazy. Let's make it a bit more... not ridiculous, like a uh, density of 10. 
And again, it basically doesn't go anywhere, it just falls very slowly as the weight fights off the enormous density. So as far as I can tell, this is all working. Let's put the density back at something sensible. And we've now done something that you couldn't easily do just with mathematics.